Welcome to Extreme Reloading. In this episode, we're going to talk about annealing and the order of operations. Stand by. If you watched our recent series on annealing and its effect on precision, you might have also noticed some of the comments, some of the questions by our viewers. And some of those comments and questions talked about or asked about the order of operations. Why did I resize and then anneal instead of anneal and then resize? Well, there are two camps or trains of thought on this. And the first train of thought goes like this. Um, according to some past studies, specifically Stevenson's dissertation, he found the process of resizing the brass actually began work hardening the neck and mouth of the case. So the thought then is go ahead and resize and then anneal to eliminate that work hardening and keep that mouth and neck as ductile and supple as possible. Now the second train of thought goes like this. Uh, and there is a paper also out there with this idea. And the idea is that annealing has the potential to change the um, dimensions of the brass by itself during that heating process. Now it has the potential, that was pointed out in the paper, that it has the potential to make those changes. So why take the chance of those changes happening? So in that case, anneal and then resize, thereby eliminating any changes in the dimensions of the brass that might be caused by the annealing process. Now both of these trains of thought have a lot of merit to them. What we're trying to do is end up with the most consistent and uniform cases that we possibly can. And so what I've done is I have uh, taken both of those trains of thought and I went through another experiment, another test to monitor the dimensions of a brass case all the way through the case preparation process. Now, I didn't use just one case, I used 10 cases in what I'm calling set one and 10 cases in what I'm calling set number two. Both of these uh, 10 brass cases are once fired brass from the same box of brass. So for each of those 10 cases in set one and the 10 cases in set two, I'm making measurements at what's called five different datum points. Those datum points are designated as A, B, C, D, and E, E being overall length. And I'm not making just one measurement at each of those points, I'm making two measurements. One of those being horizontal to the head stamp and the other vertical to the head stamp. Let me walk you through this process so you can understand the measurements that I'm making. I'm going to start off with measurement A, and I'm positioning the case so that what I'm making here is that measurement that I'm calling vertical to the head stamp. And we see that that measurement is 0.470, which is right in there with a normal SAMI spec. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to position the case in such a way and hold it so that all my subsequent measures, B, C, D, are made uniformly at what I'm calling the horizontal and vertical orientation across that head stamp. This is the location of my B measurement and I'm trying to take that right at the point of that shoulder. There we see a measurement of 0 0.5, 0 0.453. 
Now the next one is actually the trickiest measurement to make. And I'm going to use the thinnest part of these calipers, position it at the furthest part of the neck, but not going up into the shoulder itself. Then I'm rotating my hand, rotating my hand 90 degrees to make that second measurement. I'm not rolling the case in my fingers, I'm actually rotating my entire wrist. Now one thing I should point out is what these, what these measurements really mean and how to interpret these measurements. We're seeing a measurement there of 0 0.340. And what that means is that the true measurement of that case at, at that point is between 0 0.339 and 0 0.341. And that is because the accuracy, or rather precision, of this uh, instrument is plus or minus one thousandth of an inch. That is also true of uh, the Mitutoyo uh, digital caliper as well. This happens to be one that I picked up a number of years ago from Harbor Freight. Now measurement C is right at the mouth of the case itself and I'm checking where my hand is positioned so I'm making the correct measurement and positioning that mouth on the wider part of those calipers and purposely trying to rest it at about halfway on uh, that wide part and there's our measurement. Make that first measurement, rotate it, make the second measurement. Both of those measurements are recorded and I'm going to use the average of those two measurements uh, as we then start making our comparisons. Lastly, going to make those two measurements with overall length. Again, what I'm calling vertical to the head stamp and what I'm calling horizontal to the head stamp. And there we can see the measurement 2.024. Rotate it. Make sure everything's squared up so we're getting a good accurate measurement 2.024 once again. So as a result I have 10 measurements per case and 100 measurements per set and I'm repeating those measurements throughout the case preparation process. So that case prep process for set number one goes like this. I am annealing and then resizing. But before anything happens to those cases, any sort of case prep at all, I am making those measurements. Then I am decapping that case, annealing that case, and my annealing process um, is, is probably very standard. Um, I did a little test case, a piece of brass, I did some testing on it, make sure that I'm affecting the correct uh, annealing on it uh, for, this particular, uh, for this particular brass, and the setting that I'm using is 47. Um, and also to make sure that I'm not messing up the case during that process and I am maintaining the exact same order so my repeated measurements are actually on the exact same case. I am keeping these things in order from 1 to 10, just dealing with one set at a time. I'm taking very carefully, removing that case after it has been annealed, placing it on a metal tray where it then is allowed to cool. I'm actually annealing very carefully one case at a time to keep that order exactly the same so I can make those measurements and comparisons uh, and make those exactly the same later on. That same annealing process was used for set number one and set number two. Let me continue in that case prep process. So after annealing, I'm making those same measurements once again. Then I'm resizing, full length resizing, 
with my Redding Competition sizing die and a 0 0.334 titanium bushing. After resizing, same measurements occurring once again, another 100 measurements on those cases. Then I'm continuing the case prep process. Trim to length, chamfer, deburr, prepare the primer pockets, and expand the necks using my 21st century neck expanding mandrel. Then I'm making those same measurements once again. Set number two is very, very similar uh, to how I proceeded with step uh, set number one, but set number two is where I resized first and then annealed. Again, before making any of those case preparations, I took all of those 100 measurements on those 10 cases. Then I resized, made the measurements, annealed, made the measurements, completed the case prep process, measured once again. Then all of those measurements were entered into an Excel spreadsheet and I started making my comparisons. How those case dimensions changed within set one and within set two throughout the case preparation process and then I compared final products. Now, let's take a look at the results. You know, just to save you a little bit of time, final answer is there's no difference between the final case dimensions regardless of whether I anneal and then resize or resize and then anneal. But as I always say, the proof is in the pudding and I'm preparing to uh, reload these cases that I just prepared. I'm going to shoot five rounds of set one, five rounds of set number two. We'll see if that shows any difference. And uh, we're going to do that in an upcoming video. But right now, let's talk about these results. Now the dot one step, in other words, set 1.1 and 2.1, this is the cases I simply plucked from the bag and started uh, measuring. No um, case prep at all. And we're seeing some average differences. But when we look at those average dif differences, they are, for the most part, all within the tolerances of the instrument used to make those measurements, except for measurement C, which is a hard one. It's a more difficult measurement to get uh, good repeatable measures on simply because the exact placement of a caliper is so important to that measurement. And the uh, measurement at point E, which is overall length, that actually showed quite a bit of difference, which is kind of expected because those rounds were just fired. They grew inside that chamber. They changed their shape a little bit, I guess. Uh, and oftentimes we see that lengthening of the case after firing. So nothing too um, unexpected here. Now let's look at set or step dot two. In other words, set one dot two and two dot two. 1.2 represents the case measurements after the case had been decapped or deprimed and annealed. Measurements for 2.2 represent the case measurements following resizing. So the case head measurements showed no difference, no measurable or true difference, but all other measurements showed quite a bit of difference. And that, too, is not surprising because we resized one set of cases and didn't resize the other set. So, again, no real surprises there. It is kind of interesting, though, to see how much of a difference resizing does make. Now, when we look at the dot three comparisons, that is 1.3 and 2.3, this is where set one has been resized, so it was annealed, and now it's being resized, and set 2.3 has been annealed. That is where it was resized, and now it has been annealed. 
So results of the dot three comparisons, would you look at that? We are seeing essentially no difference, not even um, a difference in how things were measured, really no difference at all in these things except for overall length. Again, not surprising whatsoever because we have not yet trimmed uh, those cases. And in fact, the dot four measurements, 1.4 and 2.4, uh, represent measurements made when uh, the complete case preparation has been achieved. In other words, those cases have been trimmed to length, chamfered, deburred, primer pockets prepared, etc., etc., etc. Now let's take a look at those results and what do we see? No difference at all. In fact, the only difference that is above the tolerances of the instrumentation is letter E, overall length. That one does take me by surprise. I thought I was, you know, really being so absolutely careful. I've got some excellent equipment. That Wilson uh, case trimmer is, is such a nice trimmer. Uh, I'm sure that that thing gets it down to a thousandth of an inch. But what I didn't realize is, and I think this is what's happening, that once I go to the chamfer and deburr step on the case prep, I think I am um, introducing some variability there. And so in the future, I want to be a little bit more careful. We're seeing two thousandths of an inch uh, difference between set one and set two. I was hoping that we'd get that down below the measurable uh, tolerances. But even so, two thousandths of an inch of difference is really, really quite small and almost certainly not attributable to the order of operation. So that wraps it up for this order of operations video. I am going to go ahead and load these or uh, 10 of these cases, five of each, and I'll be going out to the range. Uh, that's going to be coming up in a future episode of Extreme Reloading. I hope you tune in to catch that one. Thanks for watching.